fitting that we have the representation here. Um, there's certainly their expertise, knowledge and unique position to help drive innovation and uh, through policy equipment and systems. So uh, let's get on with the show. Bill, All right. I'll hand over to you to start. Thank you. I think we're going to jump in right to the uh, remarketing topic and uh, maybe we'll ask uh, uh, Chris here from Lease Plan to go first and, and go down the line. Um, with that, uh, outside of, of fuel, vehicle depreciation is, is obviously the largest contributor to a, a car's TCO. Um, and, and residual values, as we know, are based on the number of years that we, we think a, a vehicle will be retained and, and the expected distance that we're going to travel in that vehicle. Um, failure to achieve the residual value um, uh, uh, during the remarketing process is, obviously delivers a, an unexpected loss. But I think it's interesting to, to, to um, go through this and talk a little bit about who holds that risk to the residual value, because if you're, you're just playing in one market, you may not realize the nuances to that. So, um, Chris, if you can talk about that in the American marketplace, but also, uh, and, and probably more importantly uh, in this conversation, how do you see the use of telematics data in helping to strengthen the, the, the price and the, the remarketing value um, in the future? Great. Will do. Thank you, uh, Bill. And appreciate all of y'all being here, no matter uh, which companies you're with. Um, appreciate you uh, you attending. Um, and so, yeah, we want to start out with remarketing, which is kind of an interesting use case in the world of telematics. Um, as Bill mentioned, I guess we'll kind of start with who holds the residual risk. Obviously, in the uh, the U.S. market, with probably 90% of that risk being held by the uh, by the lessee, um, as opposed to the uh, the lessor, which I'm sure we'll hear differently in the uh, the other regions. Um, so that's a big contributing factor, but I think, you know, not only ourselves, lease plan, but also uh, the other FMCs, it doesn't really matter that we don't hold that risk. Um, we're obviously working to get every single dollar that we can uh, for our clients at the back end of that, uh, that asset life. Um, so while it's important, right, um, you know, well, obviously it, it doesn't really impact how we do things. We're trying to get every dollar that we can. And so on the telematics side, it's really not something that you hear a lot about. You know, we'll talk about things like safety and we'll talk about productivity and use cases that are obviously much more popular uh, when it comes to telematics. But it's pretty interesting that there's so much data being produced on these vehicles. And obviously that data can play a factor in what type of uh, resale values you get. It's also interesting that it can potentially cut, it's kind of a sword that can potentially cut both ways too. So when you think about it, um, now you, know, you really have a lot of knowledge into how was that vehicle driven. You know, was it, you know, when, when you go out and you buy a vehicle, personal vehicle, and you're buying a used vehicle, are you going to look to buy a vehicle from the teenager who's, you know, working that vehicle pretty hard, speeding up and down, harsh braking, harsh accelerations, or do you want to buy the vehicle from the grandmother down the street who didn't put a whole lot of miles on it, mm -hmm. right? She took it really easy on the, on the asset. Um, that's really good information to know when you're acquiring a vehicle. Well, guess what? Obviously, that type of information becomes available through telematics. Um, now, the challenge to that, obviously, is that you know, you're going to know the good drivers and you're going to know the ones that are going to drive up that value, but you're also going to be disclosing the bad drivers and the ones that have really driven those vehicles maybe a little bit rougher, um, and so you run the risk of maybe potentially uh, reducing the value there. So you got to kind of be, uh, be careful with that or at least go into it with open eyes and, and knowing as well. And the other piece you got to think about uh, as it comes to telematics and connected vehicles is that you've got a lot more insight into location and availability. Um, I think most of us, well, pro we're probably not so shocked anymore, but some people might be shocked about how folks just don't know where their vehicles are and, and, and what condition they're in and so forth. So as it gets to end of life, just the fact of knowing where it is, when it's available, getting it to market quicker, getting it to the, uh, the right remarketing locations uh, can really help improve that, uh, that residual value. Great. Good? Great, thank All you. Right. I'm going to hand the microphone down. Oh, Let's go down the line, I think. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for, uh, for being here. Uh, at the end of the, uh, the Connect session, I know this is kind of grueling. It's the last session, so uh, I hope the, uh, the subject matter is interesting enough for, for you folks. Um, so you know, we have a similar story. Uh, we're in the same business, and we see that in North America, about 90% of our customers are taking the risk um, at, the end of, uh, at the end of that lease. Uh, the story is a little bit different in Europe, um, and you know we don't have a wide footprint in Europe. Uh, it's only in the UK and Germany, uh, but those markets tend to 
uh, the clients tend to be more risk averse, so they're paying a set fee, uh, and in that fee is um, is the residual value of uh, of the vehicle. Um, the way we try to help our clients uh, is, of course, to uh, create some replacement models, um, and we look at the 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 vehicle performance. Um, and not just uh, the vehicle performance that we see through maintenance, et cetera, but now telematics is giving us a little bit more insight about, about that vehicle. Um, and um, even perhaps, and I, we're not doing this today, but in the future, um, you know, if you think about the capability that, that you folks have seen here about maybe predicting you know, the failures uh, well in advance, uh, can play uh, some insight in the in the replacement model. Um, you know, we have this vision of this, you know, Carfax on steroids, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, you know, all the things about you know accidents, etc. Uh, imagine, you know, that being enhanced with things like you know, it's it's been driving in the sun belt or the snow belt and those types of metrics as part of that report. Thank you. Well. Uh, Glad to join you. Um, hopefully, I'm going to give you a little bit of insight about my region. I'm from Mexico, so I'm going to be speaking Latin America and mainly Mexico. But the thing for remarketing, what I was, what I was just thinking and, and bouncing off with uh, companies that um, we need to understand really what the customers are uh, needing because residual value and uh, the, the, the importance of this uh, uh, in the equation of the, of the operation is going to be uh, directly tied to the operation that they have. So if we don't fully understand what's, uh, what's the requirement, uh, we're not going to be giving a very good uh, opportunity for the customer. And I'm saying this because in our market, most of our uh, customers take the risk for, for this part. So um, understanding that it's going to be a, a huge uh, motor for, for this value added proposition. And um, I think with telematics, what we are getting now and what we should be thinking now is that we need to be more proactive in the way that we operate the business. Because right now, what we do is if we have maintenance, an area of maintenance, uh, you pick up a phone call that someone needs maintenance, but now with telematics, you're able to predict that and you're able to shift the gear on the whole ecosystem to really propose this uh, uh, added value. So remarketing is going to be, uh, of course, uh, benefited for everyone. And uh, in our experience, remarketing is uh, it's, uh, it's a very huge market in Latin America. So uh, there's a good opportunity with connected cars uh, whatsoever with, uh, with that approach, definitely. Great. I think there's a lot of opportunity in, in that space. And in all honesty, I, I never really thought very much about the the use of telematics data and the remarketing side of our industry until we started talking about this panel and this session. And, um, and, and just the, the more I think about it, the more, the, the more there's an obvious connection to it, just how that's going to play out in the future. And, um, uh, and like Louis said, the, 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 even like the artificial, or artificial intelligence piece of it, like predicting when your car is going to need maintenance before it needs maintenance and, and whatnot, I think uh, could, could really uh, change the landscape a little bit in that, that area. But, but having said that, are there any questions in the audience? We'd love to, uh, I think we're gonna take this topic by topic because we are jumping around a little bit. Um, uh, but does anybody have a question for our panelists here? Let me bring the mic over to you. <clears throat> could say your name too, please. Yeah, so I'm uh, Sarah Kerr, an EV uh, product manager here with Geotab. And one question I have uh, quite a bit um, with, with, especially with FMCs, is the question of electric vehicles and residual value. Uh, I know the jury's out, but I would love to hear any thoughts uh, that, that you have or if you've even, even attempted uh, that. 
Well, great question. <laughs> Who'd like to jump in on that one? Yeah, I, I know at ARI, uh, you know, we have a lot of initiatives that have been started up by, uh, by clients, uh, and I'm sure residual value at some point down the line will play a, a huge role uh, in electric vehicles, uh, but uh, I, I think we're really at the, at the starting gate now and, and looking at those challenges, uh, you know, being able to charge them to very basic challenges that we have to get through before we start thinking about, uh, about those. And, and hopefully the electric vehicles, um, you know, that challenge will come much later uh, than uh, in, in today's vehicles. I would like also to jump on that question. Um, in Latin America, adoption for EVs and HEVs, it's, it's, it has just started. I think it has, well, there's a vehicle that has been there for 10 years or so, but it really didn't ramp up until a couple of years. So uh, we don't have too much vehicles and we don't have too many options yet, and we're still kind of like building up all the, all the uh, portfolio of EVs or, and so. And um, basically in Latin America, uh, remarketing it's based more on, on year model than anything else. And, but with HEVs or EVs and with the data that we can collect from, tele, from telematics, for sure is gonna be giving up uh, more insights on, uh, on the vehicle usage and therefore it's gonna be a, a more optimal uh, price for remarketing. Yeah, and probably the only thing I would add to that, because um, we're all kind of in the same position as far as data and adoption goes, is that uh, when you're having those discussions, kind of one of the first questions you've gotta ask is, why are you looking at EVs, right? If you're looking at EVs as a cost-saving opportunity right now, then maybe you're not looking at it at the, uh, with the right lens. You know, in, in most cases, a lot of companies are looking at it because of sustainability initiatives and, and uh, corporate initiatives, which is great, it's, it's wonderful. Um, but at the end of the day, it may not be a, a cost type of play. So while residual values are incredibly important, you've got to plan for those. Um, if, if that's your deciding factor in using electric vehicles, then you kind of got to reevaluate why you're, why you're heading down that direction. Um, uh, from an Australian point of view, if anyone's interested, um, <laughs> So, <laughs> we're, uh, so in Australia, I guess the, um, the, the FMC is holding the risk on all residual values. When we start to talk around EVs and, and what their residuals are going to be, um, beyond sustainability reasons for taking on an EV, the, the real, beyond that, it all comes down to total cost of ownership. I've got plenty of fleet managers that talk to me about being directed to go EV and they're going, can't get my head around it, the, the TCO doesn't work. And I think one of the things you've got to understand is we'll flip out a car and generally three to four years will be the general cycle of a turnover. Whereas an EV, you need to hold it for six to seven years and you'll get the same TCO out, right? But then you've just got that, the things, well, oh, am I gonna hold the car for seven years? That means the safety equipment's seven years old at the end of the term. Um, in Australia, the warranty provided on the battery is out to eight years, so that's okay, you've got no contingent risk, but the warranty on the car is only five. So there are a whole range of challenges. Uh, what we do as an association is try and put bums on seats. You know, how many people here has driven an electric vehicle? That's pretty good, that's uh, just over 50% of the room. If I asked the same question in Australia two years ago, it'd be like 10% of the room. Now it's actually starting to get quite high because we, you need people to, to embrace the vehicle for what it is and what it can do. We have all the same vehicles available as you do here. Um, 2019 saw a tenfold jump in sales, but really it only represents 1% of our new vehicle sales. And that was brought about by uh, Tesla's Model 3, which arrived in the last quarter for a lot of pent up demand. And then we had uh, Hyundai's uh, Kona, um, which is jumping out that small SUV, everyone wants one. And what we found over this 2019, what was surprising for the manufacturers, is that private buyers are buying these. So there's a lot of people, the baby boomers, et cetera, that, that want to be sustainable. They've got a bit of extra money. They're gonna keep the car for a long time. It's got extended warranties on the battery, so they're, they're actually anting up. So it actually, it's been surprisingly driven by private buyers but uh, built up demand from fleets and they're all struggling 
with infrastructure, etc. But infrastructure, um, you know, when you ask someone about EVs, the first thing they say is range anxiety. That just shows they know nothing <laughs> about EVs. And then you go infrastructure, and I get infrastructure from a business point of view, but most people are charging at home. And um, you know, so there are a whole range of meters now that, that go on the plug, so you can actually reimburse your employee for the, for the trickle charging they're doing at home. So there's solutions for every problem. You just got to open your mind. Anyway, that's my bit. I, so I do have a follow-up question to that. And you know, there's a growing consensus, or there's a growing um, belief now that the guidebooks, the residual guidebooks, are really grossly underestimating battery life. Um, most of the guidebooks tend to anticipate that a battery life is 100,000 miles and you have to get a brand new battery, which is a big retardant to a secondary buyer because no secondary buyer wants to incur that additional eight to $10,000 to put in a new battery. But there's a lot of real world experience now with, uh, with hybrid manufacturers on their models uh, in actual service, fleet service. And, and I cite Toyota Prius as an example. I don't know too many people that have actually had to buy a second battery for a Toyota Prius. And it's not just them, but I think it's just the lithium batteries in general. And, and that's one of the things that I think would really help lower the TCO, total cost of ownership for, for EVs, is if you reduce that depreciation rate Correct. on it. And all of a sudden, that's going to make it very affordable from a leasing standpoint and also help create a secondary resale market for it. So I would really suggest and encourage the FMCs, the fleet management companies, to talk to their guidebooks and, and really ask them to reassess what their, uh, the deduct that they're putting <coughs> on for uh, hybrids and batteries. And you know, in your own databases, you must have actual real world data in there on how long these batteries last and how many of your clients actually have to buy a secondary uh, battery. Um, my s assumption is that it's probably gonna be a pretty low number. I, most of these batteries go well beyond 100,000 miles, which definitely opens up that secondary market. The, um uh, the gentleman yesterday afternoon, his presentation showed the Tesla and showed the battery degradation over 10 years and it was less than 10%, which is great for Tesla. If you go to uh, Nissan Leaf that's been in service for Australia for seven years, um, many of those have similar situations, almost no battery degradation, but there was some of the earlier Leafs that have had 20 and 30% battery degradation. So um, it is an educational process when you start to look at New battery technologies used in uh, the Hyundai, etc. You know, there's a whole range of supercooling that's happening because of the fast charging. So the technology is moving at a great rate of knots. It's just trying to keep people up with that technology is difficult. The real view, I think, from a fleet manager, if you take that view, you're going to hold the the car for potential. If you own the car rather than a lease, uh, and you're going to hold that car for seven years, you're probably going to be able to trade out of it within three or four because demand is, is coming like a wave, right? You'll take a low position, which means you'll be able to positively get out of that car much sooner and go into another EV with a slightly lower investment. So. Yeah, I'd just like to add a follow-up. I mean, we're here at the Geotab Connect conference, and I'd be really derelict not to point out that they've got a very powerful new tool, which is a yeah. battery degradation tool. And, and I think that really needs to be uh, applied wholesale um, when determining total cost of ownership. Um, and doing those reassessments. AFMA is trying to find some uh, specialists that will be able to actually, so we're trying to encourage a, an online portal for all EVs to be a marketplace. And we're also then looking at professionals to be able to do the battery degradation, because gone are the days if you want to buy a car privately, you go and get your, your roadside service to do an inspection on the vehicle, but now you actually need to understand how the battery life is. Um, so you need that extra test to provide people with uh, the comfort that they're not going to buy a problem. So, Okay, we'll move on to the next question. So uh, this is the FMC's role in implementing global strategies. Gone are the days when businesses would confine their operations to local or regional markets. Operating a business on a global scale helps organisations expand their market share, reduce costs and become more competitive. Managing a global fleet presents many opportunities, however it greatly increases the complexity. Um, so the question here is, how do, the, how do each of you FMCs help your clients implement their global strategies at a local level? 
Yeah, and, and it's become a lot easier to do business uh, globally. Um, we, as I explained before, don't have a tremendous global or direct global footprint. Um, we're in North America and in Mexico um, and in the UK and Germany. And in those countries, um, we do very well. We understand uh, much of the culture and all of the issues uh, that one might have in trying to project a, a, uh, a global strategy. Um, and you know, some, of those, some of those things are things like privacy and policies and um, you know, local laws, et cetera. So um, uh, in the countries that uh, we don't have a, a local presence, we work through uh, different partners. Um, and um, uh, from a global perspective, in order to give them the, the global uh, insight about how the fleet is doing globally, <clears throat> we've developed a, um, a, a global reporting system where we have select pieces of uh, KPIs that are coming in so that they have a, a single view. But implementing those things uh, across all countries can sometimes be very difficult. Uh, and it's said easy, right? Like when you say that you need to be implementing tools, global tools, uh, it's said easy, but it's it's really hard. Uh, and uh, I would agree also with Luis what he said about uh, this this understanding that you need to have about the local markets. So you need to act kind of like global, right? You need to act at a global level, but <laughs> with a local approach. And uh, there's uh, what I've seen that really works out is that when you have a, a, a really a, a one single point of contact person or maybe two, two people uh, in that team, what they do is that they are the, like the liaison or the translator or the link with, between every local market for you to really understand what's the requirement and how can you give them more value. Uh, we have also, as a fleet management company, provided uh, global tools and uh, global reviews about the performance of the fleet for us to give some global insights, right? But uh, this is uh, it's very complicated, it's like a, you need to be like uh, the guy in, a, in an orchestra, you know, to direct. And uh, you need a lot of uh, commitment and compromise from everyone. But um, I think that's the best uh, way to really provide the customer with a global uh, uh, and a local approach. All right, global. I'm going to steal that one, by the way. <laughs> That's good. I hadn't heard that one yet. Um, so we, we talk a lot about um, product harmonization when working with our global clients and global fleet managers. Same idea, right? Thinking globally, having uh, harmonized products across the different borders. Uh, but we also realize that, you know, thinking globally right with having to act local. And that's why I think it's really important that you've got strategic partners out there that also have similar type of footprints globally that can offer similar types of services adapted for those, uh, for those local markets. You know, we probably all are all seen the experience of you get a new maybe procurement person in there, they're aggressive, they want to make, some, make a big impact, they go and they negotiate a great deal globally with a manufacturer, let's say, and then all of a sudden they try to, lo they try to implement that locally. Well, all of a sudden, you're trying to fit a square peg in a round hole, you know? You ever try to go into Germany and try to uh, implement a, a U.S. <laughs> brand vehicle in there? It's not going to happen, right? Um, so you've really got to be able to have those partnerships out there that can, again, have that, um, have that harmonization, but at the same time be able to deliver locally, too. Cool. So uh, any questions from the floor? Silence. I have a question for you. Should we rebrand? We have the, uh, our two associations and a few others have the Global Fleet Networking Consortium. Maybe we should call it the Global. The Global. Fleet. Yeah, Could maybe. <laughs> anyway. Let's get lots of comments. Right? <laughs> there you go. All right. Um, let's talk next about uh, uh, driving a safety culture. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Motor vehicle accidents cost uh, employers uh, uh, nearly $57 billion in 2017. 
Um, and, and the number of auto accidents and injuries remain at, at, uh, at record high levels, with 40% of these vehicle accidents being work-related. Between medical expenses for their employees and others involved in an accident, insurance increases and property damage costs and, and the true financial impact of accidents on, on business is really shocking. So uh, with that, what safety initiatives um, do you consider to be the, the building blocks of really building a, 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 a safety culture within an organization? Okay, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna put, a, put out some more context around that mm -hmm. safety. Uh, uh, topic. So, does anyone know what's the maximum occupancy here in San Diego Convention Center? Anyone? No. 125,000 people. So, according to World Health Organization, in 2018, and we've seen this number, I think, across many for forums, uh, 1.3 million people died that year related to car accidents. So imagine the convention center here that we are sitting out, and uh, 11 convention centers, that's the people, right? Um, for Latin America, it's a, it's a big problem. 93% um, of these deaths come from medium to low income countries. So um, here the approach, what we need to do for fleet management companies is to work directly with governments and organizations to uh, pursue and lead initiatives to seize on these uh, accidents or to lower the, the rate. Um, but we also need to face reality, right? And that it's happening right now. So um, what fleet management companies can do on my perspective on, on the on the market perspective is that uh, we can provide with any inside information tool uh, training uh, you know recommendation whatever can help customers to reduce and to prevent these accidents so um, I would say that's the that's the key initiative right now for uh, developing countries, uh, prevention, and being aware of those forums and those initiatives that are coming from government or private uh, to just pursue and to make a, a, a bigger <coughs> mechanism for safety. Down here? All right. Yeah, I mean, this, this is as much of a no-brainer as there is in our industry, right? I mean, if you're not if you're not considering safety to be almost low-hanging fruit when it comes to connected vehicles, um, then let's have let's have a talk, right? Because I know within our organization we really tightly link the two. You know, connected vehicles safety are incredibly integrated um, because <laughs> at the end of the day, it's obviously it's about saving lives. And these types of tools enable us to, our clients, right, to save lives within their fleets. Uh, it's kind of interesting, uh, Mike's in there in the front row. I did a uh, presentation at the uh, Fleet Safety Conference earlier this year uh, with one of our clients, Fleet Manager. And at a safety conference, 75% of the discussion and the presentation was about telematics, right, and how it relates to connected vehicles and how it relates to safety. Um, and what was really interesting is that the, uh, the fleet manager um, spoke so much about connected vehicles and telematics, and he hadn't even implemented telematics yet within his fleet. Yet, yeah, working on that. Um, but, you know, there's just, there's just a ton of opportunities. Um, and the tools are there, the tools are available, the data is there. I always get a little bit frustrated uh, when I kind of hear the feedback of don't want to know, don't want to know, don't want to know, right? What I don't know can't hurt me. Right. Um, maybe, but it can hurt other people, right? And that's kind of the attitude you've got to take is that what can we do? How can we make our roads safer if we're willing to implement these types of, uh, these types of products, these types of tools, uh, and get the, uh, the intended effects out of them? Yeah, I, we're not hearing the plausible deniability uh, excuse anymore <laughs> these days. It doesn't hold water anymore. Um, but but I, I, think, I think that organizations have truly changed um, uh, we talk about spending lots of money on, on technology, telematics, um, and I think that companies are now willing to make the investment 
uh, and, the, and, and the number one initiative that we always hear uh, is safety now. Uh, in the past, I reduced idling and uh, operational, et cetera. Um, and I think we hear that over and over again. And I think the first thing that uh, organizations need to do is, is to uh, develop a, a, a policy. Many organizations don't even have a policy. Make sure you communicate that to the employees. Uh, help them understand why you're doing it, right? Because, you know, we, we talked about a lot of numbers and, and money. Um, at the end of the day, I think organizations just want to see their employees safe and to go home to their families. Um, and I think if everyone has those, those common goals, I think the tools are truly in place um, to, to help. And, and then the tools that you use um, are different in each of, the, each of the organizations depending on what culture they have, right? And we talk about gamification. Well, gamification isn't going to work everywhere. You know, in some organizations, it has to be the line manager that tells them stop doing that, right? Uh, where you know some you can you know you could make it fun. So, um, but I, I think first and foremost, I, I, uh, many companies have not even um, communicated to to their people that they want to change their culture. Great. <laughs> you know, I I would like to add on that. Uh, I just reminded there was one customer I was working with. And they were, uh, the objective was to have a safe fleet, right? And um, so they didn't have any policy and uh, they, they just had the objective, but they didn't know how to get there. And uh, we started going back and forth and, and, and pinpointing what were the tasks in order to be that attacked. And, uh, the communication part is essential because in this example, uh, the customer saw the information with telematics and then they executed on that. Hey, this guy, he's not driving that good. This guy, he drives very good. And they, they, they spoke with the, with the drivers. And, uh, but if they don't do this recurrently, uh, it wouldn't matter. And uh, I saw that in, in one presentation, one speaker talked about that. And uh, <coughs> this part of communication that, is, that it needs to be uh, recurring, it's one of the keys for the fleets to be on the safe side of things. Yeah, and policy is the first step and communication is the second step and you need both of them, right? So. Any more uh, questions on this? Oh, Mike over here. I, I did have a question. Um, one of the newest trends in, uh, among fleet management companies, among fleets in general and society in general, are this mobility management. And a lot of companies are inc actively encouraging their employees to use alternate modes of transportation other than the company car, especially in city centers. Um, but I think that's an emerging safety issue. Because if you look out here, if you would take a walk through the streets of San, uh, San Diego, there are these small motorized scooters all over the place. Mm. Not one of them are equipped with a helmet. No one has any sort of training on those uh, scooters. And if an employee is being encouraged by their company to use that mode of transportation, an accident happens, there could be liability exposure in addition to injury to the employee. So it's an emerging issue that I really don't see a lot of companies addressing, and yeah. would like to get your feedback on that. So I'm going to just jump in because I'd love to talk. Um, in Australia, <laughs> <laughs> got nothing worth saying, but I just like to talk, right? So I guess at our conference uh, later in the year, we've got a session based on, on work health and safety and the scooter and, and the comparison to well-being of riding a bicycle to work. So, you know, pretty much every Australian business that's domiciled in a city is encouraging their staff to ride their bicycles to work. They put up locker rooms and that's all great. But you're more likely to be killed on a bicycle than you are on the scooter in a last mile delivery for humans, right? So I think jumping up in, in, in a city um, on a scooter, it's unsafe but I'm not sure it's any unsafer than riding actually out in traffic on a, on a bicycle. Uh, different cities have different rules around helmets. Um, Brisbane 
in Australia, uh, the helmets are in play with the bikes, which provides some other challenges for the guys providing the bikes. Um, but yeah, that council's embraced the technology and we're going to hear from a couple of experts around the work health and safety issues of last mile delivery for humans. Hmm. So. We got to else else add to that? Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would add is that um, in, in some cities, they're taking care of the problem, right? They're banning, starting to ban scooters um, because of safety concerns and safety issues. Um, but it's a really interesting point about addressing it in, in fleet policies. I do quite a bit of work with fleet policies, and I've yet to see uh, scooters ever mentioned in one. So I have a question still related to safety. I know it's near and dear to all of our hearts. Uh, Tuesday this week, Two of our fleet customers were here at the conference, and within hours of each other, they had drivers involved in crashes that had fatalities. In one case, a driver struck a motorcycle and killed both people on the motorcycle. Three hours later, I get a text from the other one that their driver struck and killed a pedestrian. Now, the first case, they know he was using his cell phone. Both of these companies have amazing compliance and safety, driver training, they have telematics, they're doing all the right things. And I think many of us in this room do. What more can fleets do when it comes to cell phones? I mean, what kind of best practices have you heard or that you can share? Because this just crushes all of us, and we need to do more. And I'm hoping, you know, unfortunately through these types of situations that we can somehow, you know, get this cell phone out of people's hands. And I'm just wondering if you have anything that you can share. I think you know the only thing that I can uh, offer is just an insight that it's uh, it's a complicated issue for technology to solve. Right? And I, I, I mean, I I go back to policy, right? I, I think employees just need to know that it's it's not acceptable. Now, I think technology is 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 catching up a bit. Um, uh, I'm seeing cameras that now are able to recognize what the driver is doing, uh, and it's not just you know, with cell phones, but is he truly paying attention, right? So, um, uh, from a technology perspective, it is a difficult problem to uh, to solve. But it, but it's not it's not a difficult thing to to communicate. And I would address that as well as part of. Uh, I know that the company did some training, right? But uh, you know, advertising. What, what usually works in advertising, has anyone seen like really cool ads or, or, or that they are like, I don't know, like they freak you out or they are kind of scary or so. Uh, but anyways, like they, these guys, they, they, they actually did what they needed to do and they, uh, they succeeded because they, they transmitted to you an idea and they got a reaction from you, right? So um, probably what um, fleet management companies and maybe more, more or less it's going to be uh, uh, customers, what they need to do, customers, is to, to understand that not, you cannot deliver the same message by the same way every time because it's not going to be doing the same impact. It's, it's going to uh, lose impact, right? So you need to find as a customer new ways to deliver that information, that training, for it to keep up with the impact and, uh, and for them to have <laughs> top of mind safety, right? Um, so the, the, message, the message would be that to, to, to really understand that you need to be adapting and evolving on those trainings as well, right? Um. We have the same issues, but thank you for involving me. Um, um, can I just uh, add on to what um, she has actually shared about the fatally cash crash with regards to distracted driving using the phone? There's two technologies you can use. Um, one of them is actually, uh, there's an app that you can lock um, the phone uh, when the vehicle is in motion. So that's such a technology available. So another technology will be using the driver monitoring to uh, alert the drivers when he attempts to use the phone. And um, the operation or the command center, they will be alerted and they can actually send via GoTalk 
to actually alert the drivers to put down the phone. So there's, or you can even immobilize the vehicle yeah. if um, the drivers persistently use the phone. So actually using technology to remind the drivers, you know, uh, that would be a way to um, cultivate, um, you know, safe driving. Because, uh, and then you have the driver's scorecard. If the driver has been attempting to use, I'm sure it's not once, um, twice, it, it will be many, many times. But I think that is where the safety policies, uh, you know, the carrot and sticks come in, the penalties come in, you know, the encouragement and awards come in. So I think we, we may have to use several approaches to actually cultivate a safer driving habits. And it's a great point, right? I mean, the, the technology is evolving, right? And it's there. I mean, there's, you can get technology or get software that will block certain things, allow certain things. I mean, people always find a reason not to use something. When it first came out, it was, oh, it drains my battery. Oh, I can't call 911 if I'm in an accident. You know, everybody will find a reason not to use it. And technology has been able to overcome that. Um, but drivers will find a way around it, right? Human beings will find a way around it. How many people now carry multiple cell phones? You've got your work phone that's got the software on it. You've got your home phone, right? Or your personal phone that, that doesn't. So I really like to comment around the, uh, the video telematics, right? That way you really start to understand what is that driver doing within the cab of that vehicle. Whether it's cell phone, whether it's other distractions, because cell phone's not the only thing that's distracting those drivers. And that type of, uh, that type of technology can recognize it, can call it out, and can be addressed with, uh, with those drivers. I think, um, who here's got, a, uses iPhone? Most of the people in the room? You're all aware for the last three generations of the software, it, it has the ability to block the phone while it's driving. And you, don't have to put, you can put some people on a list and if they call a couple of times, it'll come through. So how many of you got that activated? Good, right? Mm -hmm. Driver distracted. So we're all aware that, you know, <laughs> there's, there's an issue with, you know, I'd like to, I'd, I still old school like to be connected when I'm in the car, like to be able to make those calls between meetings and stuff. And I've just let go of that recently and it's taken a lot of adjustment. And my wife now has problems because she can't get through to me. It's like, but <laughs> you told me to put the app on. You can't have it both ways. But, you know, just using a mobile phone, hands-free, which is legal, still increases your risk of being involved in an accident by 2.4 times. And if you have an angry conversation with your partner or your boss, then that goes up to five times. And, and we talk about other distractions, just getting your sandwich out of the back seat. There are so many things that distract us. So I think mobile phones can be controlled. How do you get to the individual driver? That's a one-on-one -on -one conversation. No amount of online studies, online courses, ever gonna do it. A driver needs to speak to someone who's had a, an issue. And I, I use, uh, through some of our online training, there's a video we put in there that was produced by uh, one of the um, accident guys. And it shows, a, it's about death toll, interviewing a gentleman, and he says, well, last year we had 262 deaths in Victoria. How, what's an acceptable number? And he goes, oh, I don't know, maybe 70? And then they send 70 of his family around the corner and he sees what 70 people looks like. And he quickly gets to the point, well, no, zero is the answer. Right? We've got to have more emotive messaging that our people are receiving. Because we all think we're bulletproof. It's not going to happen to us. You know, my rant. I have a follow-up question to that. Um, I think um, a lot of times we're very narrow as to how we want to deal with uh, distracted driving. We tend to focus just on the driver. Uh, many drivers work for sales organizations, and it's the management that's real, the real culprit. They want their salespeople to be accessible, available, and pick up their call when they put a call into them. So um, when your boss calls, what's your choice? You could ignore it, but um, that's uh, an area that I don't see really addressed a lot in uh, safety training is dealing with that first-line management that expects their people to be accessible, available anytime they call. The only, uh, if you look at Shell, has a worldwide policy of uh, MOMO, you know, motor on, mobile off. And, uh, and that, they're very strong about that culturally. Um, most organizations aren't. And you, you see often that uh, the, the, the fact is on new technology, your phone should be able to be hooked up to the car and you should be able to handle it hands-free. But you've still got a heightened risk of 
being involved in an accident. So it's difficult. Okay, we're uh, coming to the final 10 minutes, so we might touch on this topic, but we may not get far through it. Is, is there anything anyone would like to discuss? Is there any? No? Happy to sit and... Okay. <laughs> Bill, you're up. That's me, no, actually. Bill, you're up, yeah. EV sourcing and implementation. So we touched on EVs earlier, right? So we know that institutional investors are, are driving our... our our board and our directors to go, we have to go EV, right? We have to, we have to be carbon neutral. And you've got many organisations, all levels of government, putting dates out there, it'd be 2025, 2030, got to be carbon neutral. In Australia, 18%, just under 18% of all emissions are coming from vehicles. So for an organisation, depending on their structure, which vertical they're in, it could be much, much higher. And uh, we've seen some statistics over the last couple of days that that show uh, refuge trucks, garbage trucks, how high their emissions are. And really, 20% uh, of or 10% garbage trucks will emit more than the other 90% of your vehicles. So how do we get this resolved? So with that in mind, uh, gentlemen, so how different is the process of procurement for an EV rather than a traditional vehicle? And uh, you know, what are some of the pitfalls that people should be looking out for? Okay, perfect. Yeah, so um, we're, we're pretty public. My organization's pretty public about our commitment to electric vehicles and sustainability. Uh, if you're curious, you can just Google lease plan and EVs. You'll have more reading material than you can ever imagine. Um, but it's just like selecting any other vehicle, right? I mean, you just don't go into it willy-nilly. You've got to make sure that you do the right research, you do the right due diligence. You know, it's all about the right vehicle for the right application. You know, we've all heard the horror stories of, you know, a chairman says we're going all electric, you know, and the next day the fleet manager's got to figure out how they, how they do that. Um, and that can be a very, uh, you know, very hairy situation. And what I really love about the implementation of telematics and connected vehicles before you make that, uh, that transition is that now you've got the data that you really need in order to be able to make that. Um, you know, is it the right vehicle? Is it the right location? Is it the right um, usage? Is it the right, uh, you know, infrastructure? Everything you really need to know is within that data so that you're just not making a wholesale change and then all of a sudden you're putting your organization in a very bad position uh, as opposed to right time, right place. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, the, the procurement process doesn't change a whole lot. It's everything that needs to come in front of that procurement process. Uh, and it's, it's not, you know, it, it, you know, is EV right for me? Because I think eventually most of the organizations will get there. It's when, right? Uh, and it's what do I need to sustain even a pilot, right? Uh, if you have, you know, a dozen vehicles, 15 vehicles, you need to, you need to think about how you're going to charge them if, you know, you're not taking the vehicles home, right? You got to call that power company. They, you know, they, they can take months or, or years to come in and bring that infrastructure. So infrastructure is uh, um, is 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 a big issue. Uh, for Latin America, uh, EVs as they are building up in in uh, you know the Latin American market, um, the infrastructure is is something that it's still under development for uh, charging stations to be available within a pretty good range for EVs. Uh, procurement, it's kind of a little bit different uh, against uh, gasoline vehicles. Um, and what, I, what we have seen there for a, a, a good process of procuring <laughs> is to, uh, besides the TCO analysis that you have for you to, to guarantee that you're gonna be having savings, is that uh, in our market, you need to have a really good understanding of the, uh, the service network that is available, the charge, charging uh, network that is available. Uh, and uh, as, as you said, uh, Chris, you're gonna be putting uh, your company in, in a very bad position. So um, fleet management companies here, they have the responsibility to uh, really give those complete insights of how the EV change is gonna be happening. Yeah, I think we can all agree, right? It's coming, 
right? So it's, are you preparing yourselves and are you preparing your organization for when it truly gets here? I mean, the product is clearly coming. If you look at the different manufacturers' roadmaps uh, for electric vehicles, they're ramping up. They're kind of bringing that uh, for nearer and nearer as they can. Um, so again, it's just making sure that you're ready um, when the product's ready and the infrastructure is ready and everything else is ready. The other thing too is that, is that you know, for all of you that raised your hand about driving an EV, they're fun, right? I mean, at the end of the day, they are a lot of fun to drive. And as we also start to see newer generations come into the workplace, they're going to kind of start to expect vehicles like that. You know, that's what they drive for their personal vehicles or that's what their family drove, whatever it happens to be. And they're going to start to have a certain expectation as far as their company vehicle is concerned too. So be ready, be prepared. You bring up a good point with the... the um the OEMs telling us that they're they're switching to the the, the EVs across the board in the in the near future. Do, do you find a lot of um, fleet managers are are ready for that, or do you do you feel a lot of them are, are at least preparing for that switch? You know what? There's a uh, we call it a lot of window shopping right now, where they're educating themselves. They want to be aware of what's out there. They're running the TCO models on it at this point in time as well, um, and really kind of preparing themselves for those questions. Because if they haven't already, mm -hmm. they're coming. And you better be prepared to answer them. So any questions from the floor? I just wanted to know. Are there government incentives still out there anymore, or that is that all dried up for EVs? General? That's a great question. <laughs> yeah, for example, uh, Latin America, they are building up the, the culture for EVs. And um, for Mexico, we have incentives. They are not sufficient enough for people to consider the change. Uh, <coughs> environmental laws and uh, transit laws sort of are like uh, racing for, for them to provide a, a benefit on those kind of vehicles. But there's not enough of a big mechanism like the laws and the, and the infrastructure and all the procedures for the, for the EVs to actually be uh, the best option for them. And uh, incentive is the biggest part for the market. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I don't have an answer for, uh, for North America. Um, I'm not the expert in, in our organization. I, I do know that 80% um, of the vehicles uh, that we provide are, are, are heavies. All right, so they, they, uh, they're used for, for a vocation. And I think still even the choices um, of the vehicles that would be available is, is not really at a commoditized level yet. Um, uh, in yesterday's keynote, I saw a lot of, a lot of different uh, vehicles and announcements, but I don't think that those vehicles yet are in, at a commoditized level. Yeah, and a lot of those incentives were uh, consumer driven as well. You know, a lot of times on the corporate side, they weren't able to take advantage of them. Um, yeah, I don't have the exact specifics either on what's still available or not, but even when they were available, they weren't necessarily, we couldn't even necessarily take advantage of them. From an Australian point of view, we've had no um, discounts or incentives on vehicle purchase price whatsoever. Um, what's driven the market there is basically that ultimately all the manufacturers were waiting for some sort of incentive scheme and it didn't happen and then Hyundai was probably, Nissan Leaf was there for some time, but um, it was a slow death for a period. Uh, and then the Hyundai brought out their new vehicles, super safe, longer battery uh, and range, and that sort of just jumped the market. And in Australia, incentives are really coming by way of uh, incentives that go throughout the life of the car. So discounted registration, free parking, no stamp duty, so uh, a couple of conversations I've had with some of the guys in Europe is that uh, incentives off the purchase price drive down the future residual value, whereas an incentive that every driver gets throughout the effective life of the car is much more real and flows through to the, the business and will flow on to the consumer in the second market. Okay. Any further questions? I think it's, uh, we're coming up on time here. so. Um, I think just to, to close it up, uh, I'll say I think uh, um, um, 
Well, first off, thanks to Geotab for letting us have this session. I think it's, it, it's important that we continue to have the, um, the best practices and next practices conversations. And, and I think it's really a reflection on the, the culture of Geotab, but also the FMCs that are here on the panel. These are the conversations that we need to have. And next year, we're probably going to be talking about some of the same topics, but the answers are going to be different. We're going to be looking for the next practices in, in, in all this space. Um, so I encourage you to, to leverage your, your, your supplier relationships, your partner relationships with your FMCs, your associations, be it AFMA or AFLA. Um, that, that's what we do. We explore best practices. Um, and and uh, I'm really looking forward to see how all these, these, uh, these, these conversations evolve. So with that, I know we're over time. Uh, thanks again for having us. And uh, we're all around if you have any questions afterwards.